Um, so what I'd like to do is um, do a little bit of an introduction and a handover uh, to our webinar presenter, Dr. Peter Stepien. So Peter is the principal engineer at ResTech, um, which is a research service provider and a joint partnership between AMP Control and the University of Newcastle. Since joining the team in 2007, um, Peter has carried out numerous investigations on earth fault limited power systems used in mining, including electric shock incidents and the impact of variable speed drives. Prior to joining ResTech, Peter worked for the Electricity Commission of New South Wales and the Centre for Industrial Control Science at the University of Newcastle. Peter received his PhD degree from the University of Sydney and is a registered CPNG and is a fellow with Engineers Australia. So I'd like to hand over and welcome Peter as our first presenter. Thank you, Emily, for your introduction. And um, thank you, everybody, for, for joining us for this um, webinar today. Um, the webinar is going to be about um, the control of touch potentials during switching. Um, also, as part of, a, of an ACARP uh, project, that started this year, um, and I'll share with you also um, what we'll be doing with regard to that particular um, our project. Um, so the webinar today, um, I want to go through basically um, uh, some background as to how we might actually generate touch potentials uh, when we have um, switching events, um, then talk about how that impacts the mining industry specifically, and then talk about the, um, the ACARP project and where we're up to um, with that. So I'll start with, the, with some uh, very basic uh, circuit fundamentals, uh, just to sort of give you an idea about you know, how we can actually uh, generate touch potentials. We're looking at a simple circuit uh, using a resistor first, then with the capacitor, and then with an inductor, and see what actually happens when we do um, switch those components to a, to a voltage source. Okay. I'll talk about how uh, touch potentials are actually um, uh, uh, Built within a um, within a um, earth fault limited um, mining environment, um, and then we'll go on to a, a more complicated uh, description of um, of a three phase load, um, and see how we can actually generate uh, transient touch potentials with uh, three phase loads, which is the predominant types of load that we find in the um, in the mining industry. So if we start with a very simple circuit, so this circuit here is basically has a, a voltage source. On the left-hand side, okay, it has a switch and a resistor on the right-hand side. And a bit of extra complexity that you inside the voltage source is that the voltage source has got some source impedance of, of one ohm. So that means that the total loop impedance of the circuit if the switch was closed is, um, is 10 ohms. And we've got a voltage source which is 10 volts, and this is a, a DC voltage source to make it uh, easier to start off with. Um, which means that we should have uh, one amp flowing around the circuit uh, when the switch is closed. Okay, so in this case here, we're just looking at just a resistor um, as a load. So if you look at the waveforms uh, for this circuit, uh, this is what they look like. So the, the top trace here is the, the voltage at the voltage source, which also includes the voltage source impedance of, of one ohm. Looking also at the voltage on the other side of the switch, and then we're also looking at the current through the switch. Okay. Now the switch is turned on here at um, at 10 milliseconds. Okay, and of course, being just a resistive circuit, we get a result that we would expect. We would expect that the current jumps up to to one amp. Okay, and of course, the voltage across the the um, uh, the resistor will be. Um, nine volts being one amp going around the circuit. Because now we have one amp uh, being delivered by the voltage source, which has a one ohm impedance, we get a, a slight drop of one volt uh, in the voltage source, um, which is basically um, uh, showing what normally happens in a in a in a um, an industrial environment. We always have transformers which have got some source impedance. When we load them, uh, they do uh, drop in voltage. So this particular circuit um, is great because there's no transient effects um, other than just the, the um, uh, current and voltage is changing instantaneously as we close the switch. And we see the same, same sort of transit happening at the end when we turn the switch off here at um, T equals um, 60, 60 milliseconds. Very fundamental. I'm, I'm sure you'll, you'll fully understand this, this circuit. But let's go a little bit more 
complex layer, but let's put a capacitor into the circuit. Okay? So here we're putting capacitor in parallel with the resistor. Everything else in the circuit um, remains the same. Now this time when we turn the, 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 um, uh, the switch on um, at t equals uh, 10 milliseconds, um, because the voltage that crossed the capacitor is initially zero volts, and the voltage across the capacitor doesn't want to change instantaneously, when we turn on the, um, turn on the, the switch, um, the voltage still remains zero volts across the capacitor, which means that our voltage uh, VL2 okay, shows us zero volts. Now, of course, if that is zero volts, we've still got a, um, a 10 volt voltage source and a, um, a one ohm uh, source impedance. So we get basically a, um, a current of, um, of 10 amps flowing through the circuit uh, in that initial stage. Now, of course, what then happens is the, the, um, the capacitor charges up, and as it does, the current drops and the voltage across the capacitor increases. And we actually reach a steady state the same as we had with the resistor um, in the previous slide. In other words, um, once the capacitor is fully charged, no more current flows through it, so it's as if the capacitor is, is no longer in the, in the circuit. However, we did get that we did get that transient response at the very start where we had a large current, larger than what we ha normally have in steady state, which is which is one ohm, uh, which is one um, amp. We also had um, we saw that the source impedance, a uh, source voltage dropped down because of the fact that we were we were drawing so much current. Um, and in fact, at the output there, it drops down to, to zero volts um, as the capacitor charges up. Now, similarly, when we turn the turn the, um, uh, the switch off, okay, capacitor then discharges through that resistor there, and because that resistor there is larger than the source impedance there, the, the time cost of that is um, slower. But the thing to note in this one is that with this addition of the capacitor, we now have a, a circuit where we have a, a current which is much larger than the steady state current of one amp. We have a current of ten amps that can flow in this. Our circuit. So that's the thing to remember. Now, if we change that now to be an inductor rather than a capacitor and do the similar sort of um, um, switching at 10 milliseconds and at 60 milliseconds. In this case here, um, the current through the inductor doesn't want to change uh, instantaneously. So, what actually happens is when we first um, uh, turn on the, the switch, current through the inductor, which is initially zero, remains at zero. So we basically have a circuit uh, which is similar to the resistive circuit, where we have uh, basically current flowing through the uh, nine ohm resistor, the one ohm internal impedance here. So we basically have one amp flowing through the circuit, and you can see that jump up there to one amp. Now, of course, as, as the current starts to throw, flow through the inductor, um, in steady state, the inductor looks like a, a short circuit. So in fact, we basically have a circuit where we have a 10 ohm voltage source, one ohm source impedance, and we have 10 amps of current flowing through there. Okay. <clears throat> now, whilst this might not be a, a practical circuit uh, uh, for, a, for a DC um, circuit, um, this is the, the, the transient that you would normally have uh, if you were going to be switching uh, an inductor. What's most interesting is that when we actually turn off the, the contactor, okay. The current still wants to keep on flowing through the inductor in the in the uh, downwards direction. Okay. As soon as we turn off the that um uh, that switch, the current wants to keep on flowing and it flows basically through the nine ohm resistor. Now of course what that means is that we actually get a, a voltage uh, spike now at VL3 in the negative direction. Uh, which is actually quite large, and once again, uh, much larger than the uh, the voltage source that we have driving the circuit. Okay? It wants to go down to minus 90 volts because we basically have um, one amp flowing through, uh, sorry, 10 amps flowing through the circuit, and we have a nine ohm uh, resistor. And that's basically what we see there is that spike here in voltage. Okay? So the take home message for this one is that we have now a situation where we have a, um, a circuit which is driven by a, um, a 10 volt um, source, yet we can have a voltage which is which is much larger than that 10 volt source.
Now, I, I, we'll come back to that in a second when we look at a, a more complex three-phase model. Um, but just, just to talk about um, how cash potentials uh, are, um, are generated within a typical um, a mining environment. And typically in a mining environment, we have systems which are designed uh, based on um, AS4871, which is an earth fault limited system, where we have the um, we have a, a cabled earth going out to our equipment, and I haven't actually shown the equipment out. I've just shown the cable going to some equipment, and then we have a, a, a neutral earthing resistor, which limits any any earth fault current, which means that if we do get a phase to earth um, fault, okay, that current that can flow in that loop is limited by that NER. And if you were to actually touch the equipment, the chassis of the equipment, the voltage that we actually perceive is the voltage across the, the cabled earth. So you can imagine what's actually happening is that fault current is flowing through the cable and we're basically feeling the effect um, of the voltage across there. There is also another path through the, through the human body and through the, um, uh, the, the physical earth as well. Um, and there's also, if you consider also another path, if the equipment is actually sitting on the physical earth, uh, which is in parallel to the cabled earth as well. Um, but it's an indirect touch potential, um, with meaning that um, we're not actually directly touching a phase voltage, which would be very hard to, to manage in a mining environment. Um, what we're doing is we're, we're basically putting the effect across the cabled earth, in other words, an indirect touch potential. So we'll be looking at um, in the next simulation, we'll be looking at what is that voltage across that cabled earth. And the thing to remember is that this, the, um, the, the simulation I'm going to show you for a three-phase model, the simulation model doesn't have any, any faults in the circuit. The circuit is basically a system uh, as a normally operating plant without any faults. Okay? However, we, I'm going to show you how we can actually get touch potential transients, which can be quite large, even though they are uh, quite short duration. Um, those short duration pulses can also be um, uh, can also be perceived, and in some cases they can also be um, can be painful. Um, and towards the uh, at the end of the uh, presentation, I'll, I'll show you some some information from um, um, AS six zero four seven nine, which basically has got um, uh, ways in which you can determine how painful a particular uh, touch potential transient might be. Um, it's also worth pointing out too that these these touch potential transients are very very fast. We're talking about microseconds in duration, um, so too fast for normal protection to operate. Um, however, um, they um, uh, they can still be they can still be um, uh, received. So we want to try and understand how they're generated, and also uh, the, the end of goal is to control those touch potentials to ensure that we don't actually. Um, uh, we can actually um, uh, that don't cause a hazard for us. Consider now a more complex circuit, um, and basically this is a, a typical uh, three-phase uh, system. Um, and um, on the left-hand side, we basically simulate substation. Uh, in this case, there's three voltage sources, the three phases, um, and a neutral earthing resistor going to to earth. Um, there's no source impedance implemented in this particular sources. Um, we're relying on the source, in, source impedance to be effectively included as part of the cable model. So this is a this is a, a cable model which takes into account some uh, uh, some series um, inductance, um, which also includes some series um, uh, resistance, and also some parallel capacitance going from the phases uh, to earth. Okay, and these types of um, these types of um, uh, parasitic capacitances are, uh, are present in all cables. And in fact, uh, cable manufacturers give give information about that uh, cable capacitance, um, and um, there is a possibility for current to flow um, through those paths uh, under normal operating conditions and also under um, uh, transient conditions when switch gear um, operates. Okay, so the contactor here is modelled um, as three switches, similar to what we saw in the in the simple um, DC models. Okay, um, and these voltage sources down here, the ones that basically turn those switches on and off, and this, this just allows uh, me to change when those uh, particular uh, uh, switches turn off, one for each phase. Okay, and then we have um, the load. 
So in this case here, the load is, is sort of modeled a bit like an inductive an induction motor where we have some, some uh, inductance and resistance going to a, to a start point and then some parasitic capacitances um, from, the, from the windings going to earth. Okay. So, um, and this, this is, this is not, not atypical to what you might find on, on any piece of equipment. The power capacitance might necessarily be associated directly with the motor. It can be part of the cable wiring of the um, of the of the um, of the equipment as well. Uh, so it can actually be can actually be more more than that. Okay, and then finally we have a person who might be touching the the chassis equipment. So this is basically the the, the cabled earth that's coming through here. And maybe I didn't make that clear. These are the three phases from the substation. This is the cabled earth, okay, which then goes to the to the load, okay. And anybody who is touching the equipment would would be touching that particular point on the circuit um, and touching ground. Um, and the thing to note is that um, these capacitors that I've shown here as part of the load and as part of the cable. These are these are not um, uh, deliberate capacitances that are in, that are included as part of the design of the equipment. These are parasitic capacitances which are there as part of just the physically construction, constructing the equipment. Um, and ideally, if those capacitances weren't there, it would be a lot easier because it'll be this path um, that actually um, uh, we will see that the current actually flows to generate our, our, our touch potential. So if I just if I just sort of relate to what we've had before with that, um, where the touch potential is actually being generated. Um, in the previous slide, I showed a, an earth fault between a phase and earth. Now consider these parasitic capacitances being that path where a, a current might flow. So a current might flow through those capacitors there, back along here through the NER, back to the neutral point of the transformer. Um, however, there's also another path which they can flow back through the cable capacitance and back around here as well. Um, and the thing to note here is that if the current flows in this path here, back through the cable capacitance, it's not being limited by the um, uh, by the um, NER. Okay, the only thing that's limiting that that current flowing in the loop are the impedances of the cable um, and whatever this parasitic capacitance actually is here. Okay, so now let's try simulating this particular system. Um, so in this case, this is a, um, a 50 hertz, uh, 1000 volt uh, supply. Um, and um, we'll be basically switching the sonnets at some point and looking to see what the, the various voltages and currents are in this particular circuit. So here's the simulation um, showing the, the, um, uh, the contactors, uh, or the, the switching happening at T equals uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, 10.1 milliseconds, okay? So this is basically all three of those, all three of those um, um, contacts switch at the same time. Okay, and of course, because we're now zoomed in so far, our three-phase uh, current of voltages look just about horizontal. They are changing slightly, but they basically look just about like like DC values. Okay, and of course, when we when we um, uh, turn on the um, uh, the switch, we then get some voltage on the other side, which correspond to the voltages here. And this is relative to the um, to the earth point of the transformer, not not necessarily to the to the local local earth. Okay, and we'd also expect then, because now that we've actually um, got some voltage on the other side of the contacts, we would expect the the current to start flowing. So this is the current flowing through the switch, and we can see that it goes from zero, and they start increasing. And of course, the rate at which they increase depends upon what the voltage is here. Okay, so depending upon whether it's um, a high or low voltage slope will be larger or smaller. Now, the thing to note here is um, this one down the bottom here is our, is our touch potential. Okay, this is what the a human a human would be feeling if they were touching the, the chassis of the of the equipment. Um, and we've, we've modeled the, the human uh, as a 1K ohm resistor, so there is some some load there. So it's not just a you know a, a, we're not trying to look at a high impedance type type of measurement. It's actually loaded by one one K ohm. Um, what we see here is that um, there actually is no touch potential. So one might say, well, actually, what's the problem? There's, there's no touch potential. We can have switching. Everything's, everything's hunky-dory. 
Um, however, this simulation is a little bit too simplistic. Um, it doesn't actually take into one, one thing which is um, uh, common to um, uh, switch gear um, and things that, that um, have been observed um, on a on, on number of occasions um, whilst doing investigations. When, when, the, um, uh, when the contractors come in, they do not all come in at the same time. In other words, there's, there's a delay between the three phases turn, uh, coming, switching on. And because we now have a situation where they switch on at different, different times, we have now a situation where we can, we've got a, um, an unbound supply and there's a possibility of pushing current now back through the, the earth. Okay? So what we actually see here is that um, when we have the earth phase switch in, um, we look at the, um, the, the voltage on the other side and actually it's, it's close to close to zero in a particular simulation. Okay? But of course, we don't get any current flow because we've only got one, one phase actually connected. So there's no actual path for the current uh, to flow um, as such, and not through the, through the load itself. Then when we get the second um, phase connected, that we now have the opportunity for some current to actually start flowing through our load. So here we have the, the red and the green phase um, connected. So we can see now the, the green one comes down here, okay? And the, 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 um, uh, and the red one is, is here, okay? We do get some, some uh, uh, change in the other phase too because we have got a connection through the motor. But basically what we see here now is we see the, the green and the red have the same current magnitude but in opposite direction as the current um, goes around. And of course, if we then bring in the, the third one, we now have three phases, and this looks a little bit similar to what we had before. We have the, the three currents uh, increasing based upon what the phase voltage is. Now, the thing is, we now have these touch potentials occurring at these switching events. This one's actually quite a small one here, but here with, on the second phase switching and the third phase switching, we get now larger touch potential events. These are, these are durations in the order of, of microseconds, but we got here, for example, a peak of about 200 volts, we got a peak of about 100 volts. Okay. And doing calculations to see whether this would actually be perceivable, um, it does come into that range where it, it, it may be perceivable. Um, the actual transient here that we see is actually quite clean because we've got a very sim simple simulation. There's not too much complexity actually in this particular um, uh, model. But we've shown now that there's a possibility of getting uh, to potential transient. Okay. Now I won't, I won't go into the off transient because that's another story, but I'll, I'll show you some, some results later on about that. So some of the take home messages from here is, uh, the current transients can be higher than steady state. We saw that even in the simple one. Similar, the voltage transients can also be higher than the steady state. Um, and also these, uh, these um, are higher than normal voltage and currents can contribute to touch potentials. We see also that the timing between the individual phases of switching also contribute to touch potential transients. Okay. So how does this actually affect the, um, the mining environment? Okay, so we we'll have a little discussion about uh, cabled earth, then I'll show you some, some site examples which give you a more realistic um, pictures of what actually happens. Okay. So, I think provided by the cable, which is which is um, one of the contributing factors. Um, normally, in any end system, we have multiple earths. Low impedance doesn't become uh, a problem. Okay, um, we do know other things that can cause uh, issues with um, cabled uh, cabled earths and generating touch potential. Things like cable symmetry. Um, that's usually one of the things that are that is tested when we when uh, touch potential is being being measured or or, or been experienced. Um, and of course, um, earth impedance, uh, both resistance and inductance, the magnitude of that also affects, uh, affects the, um, uh, the, um, the magnitude of the touch potential uh, that, that's, that, that's built. Now, fast panting currents um, find, a trans find a path through the capacitance, okay, which means that the NER is bypassed, which means that even though we've got an earth volumetric system, it doesn't actually, actually help us. And just to give you some ideas uh, of what these things might look like on a, on a real system, I've just got some, some uh, site examples of different locations of what these currents uh, and voltages might actually um, uh, look like. Okay. 
So what we have here is basically a situation where we're measuring the, the phase uh, currents and looking at the touch potential. Here only two of the phase currents are being measured, but we can see the similar sort of um, effect where we see the, the, um, the first um, uh, one switching here, second one switching here, and the third one switching here. And as we go along, we get a larger, a larger uh, transient, okay? And we get the same effect here where we have basically two currents um, being the same but opposite, um, opposite sides. And you can see the touch potential transients there. Um, this is actually off transient. Um, off transient is a bit more tricky because whilst the timing of the contractors is important, um, the thing that actually uh, makes it more complex is that we have arcing on, on off transient. And because of that arcing, we get, a, we get effectively uh, context coming in and out multiple times, which basically gives, gives that um, a more complex um, uh, uh, result. So I'm going to discuss that because that's actually another story in itself. But I thought I'd just show you um, one particular shot there. Um, and here's another another side example. Uh, this is basically showing a um, uh, an on transient. Okay, um, this is a little bit different because rather than actually touching the um, the, the equipment itself, it's actually on the cable sheath going to the equipment. Okay, so basically that's a, a, a casted coupled into the into the sheath. Uh, which actually has its own um, uh, interesting um, uh, implications as well, uh, in some ways making the, the potential transient actually um, uh, worse. And this is, and this is an unshielded uh, cable uh, where the faces can effectively couple to the, to the outside uh, surface of the, um, of the cable uh, and whatever might be on the, on the outside of the cable. So simulating these things, um, and this is, this is showing some simulations which actually have a much more complex model trying to trying to sort of show some of the some of more complex behavior. Um, the on transient is actually not not too bad trying to simulate uh, and, in, and in fact um, because it's basically the contact is coming in as that time delay between contacts which is the main contributing factor. Yes you do have to get the, the phase between the between the contacts coming in and what the supply is but apart from that it's actually not not too bad trying to do it. Um, what becomes difficult is trying to get the complex sort of uh, oscillations and um, patterns in the waveform because you basically have a, a very complex machine with lots of um, complexity in there and you have to actually simulate all those to get exactly the same waveform. But nevertheless, we do get similar sort of um, uh, patterns uh, appearing. Okay. Um, and this one here is, oops, and this is this is one for a, for the off transient, and the off transient one is um, very hard to simulate because of that random nature. Um, and the reason why it's actually so hard to simulate the um, the off transient is why we uh, are sought to to get ACAP funding to do uh, research into this area and build a physical simulation rather than try to do a um, a numerical simulation, which I'll, I'll show you later on. Um, and this is this is trying to also then do a simulation of the on-transient looking at the cable sheet. And of course, this is a different model again because we have to actually model the cable sheet, but we get the, the basic characteristics of the cable um, uh, and the, the waveform and, the, and some of the key, key um, uh, waveforms. So if you want to actually determine whether a potential transient is um, can be felt or is painful, um, this plot out of um, a 2 is basically for a capacitor discharge into a body, but it's 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 something that we can actually uh, uh, use to gauge how these short transients um, affect the human body. And down the bottom here, we have basically um, a region which is the threshold perception, and on the axis on the bottom, we have the uh, the charging voltage that the capacitor might be charged to, and the, the charge um, actually on the capacitor. Um, and then um, as we move the top right of the of the of the curve becomes progressively more perceptible to the point of being um, uh, painful. Okay. And as you go further up, this is where you, you might experience pain. And if we were to actually uh, do some of those calculations for one of those um, sites, um, these are ones where the um, these were actually done. So this is actually measured on the sheet, which actually gave a gave a, a worse result than actually on the on the machine uh, itself. Okay. Um, doing some simulations, um, we found that um, uh, if, if you actually simulate it with um, a shielded cable, um, you actually do get a much better result. And of course, um, uh, having 
and shielded cable is a solution, uh, not just for situations where you have variable speed drives, which is effectively away from the switching all the time, but basically a situation where you have a um, a, um, uh, a, individual, uh, a single uh, transient event. Um, of course, there are, we have investigated uh, situations where variable speed drives have been uh, used uh, used with a um, without a shielded cable, um, and basically you had a, a high frequency uh, touch potential permanently on a cable. So whenever you were to touch that cable, you would have actually experience the, the effect. You you only experience it when there's a switching event, um, which is also explains why it becomes um, uh, less um, uh, common because you have to have lots of things um, uh, coincide uh, before it to actually uh, to actually perceive it. Um, and this is one of the summary points. Um, the reason why we don't necessarily see a lot of this happening is because you actually have to have you know somebody touching the equipment. You have to have the switching occurring. You have to have it in the right type of the waveform. If those things coincide, then you will actually um, uh, can experience a, uh, a switching a, a transient um, voltage. Um, it seems to be relatively easy to, to, to model up on transients, more difficult to model off transients, mainly due to the arcing and also the random nature of arcing as well. Um, um, also, in some cases too, um, uh, you can also have um, uh, contact bounce um, as well. And in fact, actually the one for the cable sheet did actually uh, show some evidence of contact bounce in that particular one, even for, for an on, on transient. So the idea is, is to actually develop a hardware model to actually try and understand this problem better, where we can actually uh, generate switching events in a controlled environment um, and see what's actually um, uh, going on. This has basically led to the um, ICAP project. Um, so in the last last uh, few minutes, I'll just uh, go, go um, give you a brief overview of the ICAP project, and I guess this will sort of um, uh, lead you to uh, look forward to something uh, some results at the end of the year, um, but um, you might be interested in actually uh, knowing what we're actually doing as part of this project, given what I've just shown you uh, with these type of potential uh, transients. So the idea is that we want to investigate, you know, these type of potential transients during switching to understand them. And I guess more importantly, we want to try to work out how we can actually um, uh, uh, reduce these type of potential transients because we want to we want to effectively eliminate them or reduce them to a point where that are going to uh, be affected. Okay. Um, and of course, this is specific to equipment with um, a long trailing cable. Um, and the idea is that we also we want to basically demonstrate a solution on some yeah, some actual uh, physical mining equipment uh, at the end of the um, project, um, provided that um, all the COVID-19 restrictions are lifted by the end of the year, because if they're still in place, it might be difficult to do that, but um, we're hoping that they'll still uh, be okay. Um, and the whole idea of the outcome of the, the research is that we'll provide some guidance for OEMs to how to configure their switch gear um, or whether whether we need to develop some particular bit of um, 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 device to effectively um, ensure that your stock instances um, no longer occur during switching so we don't get these um, get, don't get these events um, occurring. Um, and in fact, it's actually the, the secondary effect of these electric shock instances that are, that are most concerning um, whilst they, they might be perceivable and sometimes painful, they don't seem to be within a range, a range of causing fibrillation. But if you're uh, on a platform at height and you get a big shock, there's a possibility of falling off the platform uh, and, and injuring uh, yourself that way. So the, the way that this project is, has been designed is that it builds, it builds on an ELV hardware and moves to LV hardware, then actually moves to trial on, on actual equipment running at normal operating voltages. Um, and basically, this has been done to, to try to understand it in a more controlled environment. It's very hard to do experiments you know, on, a, on some, some real um, mining equipment. We need to get access to it. It has to be at a, at a, at a high, uh, high operating voltage. You can do things at ELV voltages. Um, that's much more easy to, to control. And we're hoping that we can demonstrate most of it in that particular um, uh, uh, environment. Uh, if, if we can, that would actually be quite quite nice because um, we'd have to go then to a, to a high voltage model, but, but the plan is to go from ELV to LV to the, the 1000 volt uh, version uh, effectively. Um, so, so far we've actually had some students at the University of Newcastle as part of the Fondue project uh, doing some work. Um, and the initial one was actually a, a DC model, uh, not unlike what 
of the original uh, the, the, the simulation models that I showed you, uh, we're basically just trying to switch a, a, um, a relay and see, you know, what, what, how does how do the context actually uh, perform? Um, and what we saw was that um, from the control signal to the context actually closing or opening, um, the timing actually wasn't wasn't constant. The, there was actually a, a, a distribution of spreads of, um, of of times between activation and the and the relay actually operating. So this is basically a frequency histogram showing how often a particular uh, time delay occurred. So whilst there was some some mean value, um, there was also some outliers as well out to the side, um, basically forming a, a very very close to a, a Gaussian uh, distribution. Okay. So so we see that that um, there is variability even in something that we think is is um, is constant. The next version, which, which another student is working on at the moment, um, is actually building the next version, which is actually a, a three-phase AC model. Uh, so it's still ELV, uh, running at uh, 41.5 volts. So we basically have a, a, um, a three-phase um, transformer that will go from 415 to 41.5 volts. Um, it will basically power a 1.5 volt AC induction motor. And this particular bit of hardware here is basically a mic, which is a controlled uh, system which enables the switching of the three contactors um, under program control and it also models the actual um, cable and the um, and the plane itself similar to that model that I showed you for the, the three-phase model okay um, so this is actually currently being constructed uh, so this is this is a picture that the student um, uh, gave me just recently um, and he's hoping to start uh, using it to get generate some results in the next um, uh, week or so so um, that'll be quite exciting to see how that goes. And we're expecting to see basically waveforms are similar to the simulation and what we also saw on, in, the, in the field on, on real mining equipment. So just to, to wrap up uh, before we go to, before we go to uh, questions. Um, so transit path potential during switching is an ongoing problem. Uh, it's, it's, it's there and we seem to be seeing it more often uh, now than before. Uh, Maybe because um, there's just more equipment um, out there. Um, however, the reason why it's not as common as like all the time is it requires a number of constant conditions to occur at the same time. Okay, somebody has to be there. There has to be some switching occurring. The the phase voltages have to be at the right the right levels for it to occur. Okay. So we're building some uh, three phase ELV hardware, um, and hopefully they'll be they'll be generating some some results soon. That will then uh, Generate a or be used to develop a, an LV um, a hardware model. Um, if we can't get the results from that one, uh, and one of the main reasons for going to a higher voltage is that we want to try to just to have a, an arcing condition that's similar to the thousand volt one. We might find that the ELV one doesn't give us the same sort of arcing conditions for the, the off transient. The on transient, we're pretty confident that the off transients um, are less less so. Um, and in fact, the on off transients tend to generate higher touch potential transients than, than the on, on transients. Um, yet both of them can still generate perceivable touch potentials. So the idea is that um, uh, uh, at MESC uh, 2020, at the end of the year now, it's been posted at the end of the year, um, we'll be able, be able to present some results from this um, work. And of course, the, um, the final ACAP report we completed in, in 2021, which will have all results uh, from this particular uh, research. So I hope you found that, that um, our presentation, this presentation uh, interesting. Um, to me, it's always it's fascinating to think that uh, equipment that is running um, um, normally can generate a, a, a touch potential transient um, without any faults. Thank you very much. Um, and if I, I can invite you uh, for questions, if you could uh, uh, type in your questions into the question box, um, I'll be able to um, uh, answer them uh, for you. Thank you. Yes. So the question about um, uh, about the, the delay between uh, switching. So this is basically a, a, a three-phase contactor. So it's all one complete uh, unit. So. Even even it being one complete unit with basically one one uh, driving call to basically open and close them, there is still a delay between those those phases. Um, and I think if you th if you think about the construction of these uh, contactors, um, 
you can see that the, there was actually a bit of um, uh, like a there's a reasonable amount of play in the in the construction as well. You can sort of see how you can actually um, how you can actually get um, uh, some um, uh, some delay between the, the the contacts. And the fact that we've actually measured those delays in in the field uh, means that this is a this is actually um, it's actually is occurring. It's not just a, a theoretical um, uh, idea. We've just got a question here. Um, so, would there also be capacitance between the phases? I think that was in one of the initial di uh, diagrams that you you put through. Yes, that's right. Earlier so, in the presentation. That's right. Yes. So, so the the cable model that was that was presented um, basically didn't show all all the all the capacity capacitances. There was also capacitance between the phases as well. Um, however, the the path that that causes that touch potential transient is actually from the phases to to um, to to um, Earth. Okay, and the next one was um, how long is long trailing cable before we consider this scenario? Also, can this study be referenced in fixed installation, not using trailing cable in the in the metalliferous, metalliferous industry? Yes, so so I mean, the, obviously, as the cable becomes longer, it becomes uh, uh, more of an issue um, because sure the cable, the less cable capacity is between between phase and um, and uh, and earth. Now, um, once again, it depends upon the um, uh, situation. Um, if, even in metalliferous mines, um, and probably even, even more so where you don't necessarily have a very good uh, physical earth, you've only really got just that, 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 uh, that cable uh, with the earth in it, um, it, it still is possible to, to have that, that scenario where you, where you are generating a, um, a touch potential. Apologies for not being able to expand this, this box to make it bigger. <laughs> That's all right. Um, so the next one, um, and I may butcher this, so apologies, Rodney. Um, should the um, inducence in the T model for the cable be one third times LP slash two instead of three X LP slash two? I may have That's got right. that yes, wrong. That's right. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I, I guess in in that particular model, it depends upon um, how how the um, what a particular um, L is being used for that particular model. Um, I, I basically did it this way because I was coming from a um, from a, a common mode model to a to a three phase model. Um, one of the things that um, that we do uh, a lot is uh, is simulate um, uh, designs with uh, variable speed drives. Sometimes it's easier to do a common mode model uh, rather than a, than a three phase model uh, for them. Um, but otherwise, the, the actual inductance uh, values is, is in, in this case here, and that particular simulation, the, the ratio between those uh, component values was based around a, um, a type 241 uh, 1KV cable, uh, basically. Yeah. Okay, and the next question is, are there any current workarounds for these transients that you've seen in use? No, so I've actually seen anybody in particular um, uh, doing any any research in this area. Um, when I was looking at to see um, the the effect of um, uh, relays and and and, and contact is switching, I did find some some um, academic papers. Um, the ones that I found were more to do with um, um, automated applications and and not necessarily for um, like for um, LV or NV type applications. There were more more um, uh, low voltage ones. I guess. In those cases, you uh, considering that the scaling of the voltage, the currents were relatively high, and I guess there there was opportunity to get a to get a um, uh, potential. Well, wasn't so much a, a touch potential transient. They were more worried about uh, damage to the to the equipment caused by by the by the transients. So that was it for the questions that we've got in the question box. But if anybody else has any other queries, um, we might just um, hang around for another minute or so in case anyone has any last minute questions. Uh, will the scope of the project allow you to research if the energy of the touch potential is able to ignite methane? No, that wasn't part of the scope of the um, of the, the research. Um, it's, a, it's a very good question though, because I mean, that's, that's, that's one of the um, uh, things that um, is mentioned in um, AS4871. Um, uh, Whilst we always look at managing touch potentials, the, the other part is um, uh, is enough energy to to ignite uh, methane. I, I guess the 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 my my simple answer to that always is that um, 
you don't actually need that much energy at all to actually um, uh, ignite methane. And in fact, um, limiting earth bulb currents to five amps is still not not way low enough to, to ignite methane. Um, but uh, the the to go from uh, looking at these types of potential transients to seeing you know whether it could actually ignite methane is is basically a um, uh, it's it's an, it's another incremental step basically rather than having a, a human body model. Um, you basically replace that with a model where you might generate a, a, um, a spark uh, between you know, the equipment and Earth. And of course, as you see, the the um, the, the voltages are are, are high. Um, however, the amount of total energy isn't isn't overly high. So um, so I've actually actually I've actually done the calculation for these ones to see whether there's enough energy to cause uh, to cause uh, methane to ignite. Um, but that would be actually an interesting thing to to, to do. <laughs> So the next question um, from Mars is, without the knowledge to verify your simulation, not knowing the voltage on the secondary of the transformer, and it may be a different topic, will there be an increase in total voltage higher than the cable rating? Say for 0.6 slash 1 kV can be subjected to 1.2 kV phase to phase or 0.7 kV phase to Earth. That's right. Yeah, that, 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 that's correct, Mars. I mean, you can you can actually get um, um, like these high, higher voltages than what might necessarily be the the, the, the face to earth uh, rating of the cable. Um, but once again, these these are these are very very small very small transients, um, and uh, I, I suspect that there's just not enough energy to actually to to do damage to the cable as such. But once again, I haven't actually uh, looked at that. I guess my, my focus has always been on, on touch potentials. So that's also a very good, a very good question to to think about because obviously um, we don't want to we don't want to stress the cable. Um, and, in, and in fact, um, if you think about it, um, if nobody's actually touching the equipment, then you don't necessarily know whether there's been a touch potential um, uh, occurring. However, the cable is is always there. So in other words, the 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 um the earth of the cable is always connected to the equipment. You know there is always this voltage that, that occurs during during switching, um and yeah that that that, that could be um that definitely would be um you know higher. But but once again I guess for a think about the the the, the, the rating of a one kV cable, I, I think that I think actually the touch potential transient isn't actually high enough to actually be above the the um. The rating of the cable, so I think I think it's probably still going to be be okay. But yeah, it's a good 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 thought there. So there was just a quick follow up on that one. And will cable starting to fail due to this condition? Yeah, once again, I think it's I think because the um, because the energy is is relatively low. I, I don't I don't think so. Um, I, I I doubt it um, because the the path that the current actually flow, flows is through a capacitive path, and these are capacitive Cars which are which have where the capacitance values are in the order of uh, tens of uh, nanofarads. So the amount of energy that actually passes is, is quite small. However, um, when you think about uh, the human body touching some equipment, that's that's like a one k ohm load. It's, it's it's quite lightly loaded. Um, that's where it has a, has a big effect. But I don't I don't think we're going to see um, a cable damage from from this effect. Um, but still, it's a it's a good thing to to, to think about. Uh, we have one other. Um, did you consider using Transient Network Analyzer for simulations? Oh, to, to, to for the actual, for the actual like a hardware simulation, effectively. No, actually, um, I, I guess I guess we didn't actually think about um, uh, uh, doing that. Um, I guess I guess my my thought was to try to to uh, build up something that was that was effectively, uh, you know, the the analog of the of the real thing, but at a at a lower voltage. Um, but yeah, and, and I guess I guess probably as as um, as um, as this research becomes more publicised and we write papers and people will people will see that, um, I'm hoping that we'll get get more feedback from from others that might be doing similar research but maybe not necessarily um, uh, published or or um, or other ideas as well. So this is um, this is this is this is good. Thank you very much.